It is said, in the beginning, nothingness filled the world. Then the creator sower descended from the sky. He sowed a seed to the earth, which gave birth to the divine tree. This great tree bore 108 fruits, and from those ripened fruits sprouted various life forms. Some were fiends of lesser intelligence, while others were capable of abstract thought, allowing them to reason, communicate, and develop complex systems of governance, culture, and religion. There were the Gigantos of the 97th fruit, a large and mighty race. Their physical size made them a force to be reckoned with on the battlefield. However, they often spoke in the third person, and thus their speech was considered primitive. Shortly after their creation, Maninto's emerged from the 99th fruit. Unlike their giant counterparts, these beings were small in stature, but developed a quick wit and fondness for trade. Among the other intelligent life forms known to us, two races fought for dominance over the land. The humans of the 106th fruit and the winglies of the 107th. As one of the last races to surface, the winglies were exceptionally gifted. They are identified by their platinum hair and ability to fly. They are well versed in the ways of magic, perhaps in no small part due to the barbaric practices of the past. In ancient days, winglies aborted babies that showed no aptitude for magic. This cruel practice was part of the design of Deningrad's Crystal Palace, also known as the Birth City. Here, wingly babies showing magical promise were selected to be born, while the rest were cast aside. It should come as no surprise then that winglies believed other species to be inferior. They viewed humans, dragons, manintos and gigantos alike as little more than savages, playthings for their amusement. Indeed, vast colosseums were built where the oppressed races were made to fight each other in bloody battles to the death while the Winglies watched on. Such was the will of the Wingly dictator Melbu Frama, who according to folklore was responsible for imposing upon his people the abhorrent command of Wingly superiority over all peoples and races. But the creator Soa had never intended for winglies to be the last species born from the divine tree. Soa realized that his creation would one day stop developing and succumb to stagnation. And so he desired the complete destruction and regeneration of the world by the Viraj embryo, the god of destruction. The Viraj embryo was to be the 108th fruit. Its sole purpose was to obliterate the old world and give rise to a new one in its place. However, the Winglies discovered the tragedy awaiting them and sought to prevent it. The dictator Melbu Frama separated the God of Destruction's soul from its body. He trapped the soul in a crystal sphere from which he could draw almost limitless energy. By tapping into the God's magic, the Wingly dictator gained unimaginable power, which he used to subjugate all life on endiness. This legend is recited by Liberian Ute. In the age when the legend was reality, the Winglies dominated all, even the gods. The gods answered to dictator Melbu Frama's prayers and granted him ultimate power. But the power was abused. The earth of Saint Imperial Gloriano was scorched by the gods' fire and became ashen. With the soul of the God of Destruction in his grasp, Melbu could maintain his supreme authority over the populace, his rule undisputed. While the God's soul was used for malevolent purposes, the flesh of the Viraj embryo had been taken away by Melbu's sister, Shal. She created five signet spheres to seal its massive body in the sky, becoming the moon that never sets. But the signets had another purpose, to weaken her brother's power received from the crystal sphere. Disillusioned by the ruthless exploitation of other races, Shaul secretly opposed her brother out of a genuine desire to stop the tyrant. When Melbu discovered what his sister had done, he ordered the creation of the divine moon objects so that he may break the signet spheres whenever he wished and let the power from his crystal flow unabated.
Of all the Wingley followers who believed Melbu Frama's propaganda, none was more deadly than his second in command. A powerful sorcerer, Faust ruled over the Tower of Flanvel, a mobile fortress and war machine which he used to suppress and exterminate non-Winglies, who he considered unworthy and a target for discrimination. Like other Wingley cities, the tower floated in the sky. One may like to think of it as both a spear and a shield. It could rain terror down on any who opposed Wingley supremacy, but it could also move in to aid and guard the flying cities. Faust cherished his tower above all things. His strange admiration for it seems to have turned into obsession, as the tower became a symbol of both his influence and cruelty. Faust's magic was so powerful that even Melbu Frama feared him. His signature skill was his ability to create apparitions of himself that are equally as powerful as his real body. To counter this, Melbu created the Vanishing Stone to banish any apparitions Faust could summon. It appears Melbu was a mistrustful ruler, cold, calculating, and cautious of betrayal. He set up contingency plans in the form of the Divine Moon objects and the Vanishing Stone in case his allies ever changed loyalties. What he couldn't foresee, however, was the growing threat posed by the subjugated races. For how could creatures of such insignificance stand against the overwhelming magical might of the Winglies? For humans, the answer lay in the 105th species produced by the divine tree, the dragons. Since the start of Melbu's reign, dragons along with humans were deemed unfit for his utopia. They were enslaved and suffered a terrible humiliation and injustice. The anger of both man and dragon turned to a flame of fury. Then one hero rose to challenge the winged oppressors. That hero's name was Diaz. Styling himself as the Emperor of Imperial Gloriano, Diaz organized the enslaved peoples of Endiness into a dedicated army of followers. Like a wind blowing throughout the lands, spreading flame to a blazing fire, Emperor Diaz's charisma inspired dragons and people to work together. Seven incarnations of dragons served the Emperor. The dragons offered their spirits to humans, which in turn gave birth to dragoons. Their power, being a combination of the dragon's savage destructive force and the human's cunning and potential, quite possibly made the dragoon one of the most dangerous life forms to exist. Only the divine dragon refused to fight alongside and relinquish its spirit to humans. Being the strongest of all dragons, he is known to many as the king of dragons. He's a prideful creature and thus did not heed the call of Diaz in humanity's struggle for liberty. In a memory from long ago, the Dark Dragon is the only one shown in the game to give her spirit to a human. It's approached by the commander of the Dragoon army, Zeke, and his fiancée, Rose. Chosen to be the Red-Eyed Dragoon, Zeke devoted his life to freeing his people from the Winglies. He fell in love with Rose, who became the Dark Dragoon. When the Dark Dragon was sacrificed to be Rose's spirit, the couple discover it had spawned a child, which Rose named Michael. This youngling, also referred to as the Black Burst Dragon, became Rose's vassal dragon, one of many that were led by the Dragoons into battle. Alongside Zeke and Rose, five other legendary Dragoon warriors engaged in a fierce war against the Winglies. There was Kanzaz, holder of the Violet Spirit. He loved to fight and had a bloodthirsty reputation. Unlike the other Dragoons, he didn't join the war for any noble or just cause. He just wanted to keep killing, and one of his pastimes was keeping clay dolls of the people he slaughtered. It was surely the White Silver Dragoon who convinced Kanzaz to join the fight. Upon seeing her honor and nobility, Kanzaz thought that by fighting beside her, perhaps he could find salvation despite his bloodthirsty nature. In more ways than one, Shirley was the glue that held this disparate team of dragoons together. She was kind, compassionate, and hated war. For this reason, Belzac, the gold dragoon, fell in love with her. It's not clear whether his feelings were reciprocated, but he did everything he could to protect her. This huge man had a soft heart. He fought for the weak and tried to avenge the children who lost their lives to the Winglies. 
Of the two remaining Dragoons, the original Jade Dragoon's name was Suval, a scholarly man. He took an interest in life and death. Although usually calm and level-headed, he grew fearful upon learning that the Winglies were manipulating the souls of those who died. Through the Wingly subjugation of the Death City Mayfill, even the destination of the dead was being controlled by Melbu Farmer's totalitarian regime. When Siu Vale saw the endless darkness to which the Winglies were sending souls, he became desperate to avoid this fate. While the fear of death may be troubling to anyone, for the Blue Sea Dragoon Damia, she was consumed by another fear entirely. As the daughter of both human and mermaid, she lived as an outcast for most of her life and was shunned by others. It's little wonder she became fraught with loneliness. Because of her mermaid heritage, she was the perfect candidate for inheriting the Blue Sea Spirit despite only being 15 years old. After becoming a Dragoon, she attached herself to Rose, who herself had grown fond of the young girl. These seven Dragoons formed humanity's trump card, though Melbu Frama attempted to create a trump card of his own in form of the Tamed Virage, a race of beasts believed to be cultivated from seeds of the 108th fruit. The Virage served under the Winglies and was used to directly counter the ferociousness of the dragons, but even they struggled against such might. Realising the Dragoons may be too much for them, the Winglies created the Dragon Buster, an ethereal blade of yellow-orange flame that could be summoned at will. When calling the blade, tendrils sliver along the user's wrist as the sword takes shape. The handle appears to take the form of a red dragon's head, as if to resemble a dragon breathing fire when striking down an enemy. It was made specifically for slaying both dragoons and dragons. They also created the Dragon Block Staff, an elaborate staff created to weaken the dragon's formidable magic. Both of these weapons were used by the Winglies to seal away the Divine Dragon. They had feared its tremendous power and the horror that might befall them should the King of the Dragons ally itself to the human resistance. Thus, with Emperor Diaz coordinating the war effort and recruitment, and Dragoons leading the charge, the Dragon Campaign began in earnest. It was a harsh war, and both humans and Winglies suffered countless injuries and fatalities. In the capital city of Velweb, the humans constructed a cannon capable of launching gigantic arrows. Its purpose was to bring down the Wingly cities, including their spear and shield, the Tower of Flanvel. According to Rose, back then, humans not only believed that the arrows would pierce the darkness that infected the land, but also shear their corrupted hearts, which had become accustomed to being ruled. In any event, the arrow shooter fulfilled its function and brought Flanvel plummeting to the earth. The tower smashed into the wastes of Gloriano, where it had become half buried within a glacier. When Flanvel fell, the wingly Faust secluded himself deep underground, in a place he called the Land of Taboo. Unwilling to part with his precious tower, he remained there in those twisted frozen depths where he secretly conspired for the next 11,000 years to become the ruler of the world. With Faust's tower disabled, the humans could now direct their attention towards the remaining Wingly cities. One by one they were shot down, including the magic city of Aglis, the law city of Xenobatos, the birth city of Deningrad, and the death city of Mayfil. After immobilizing these Wingly strongholds, all that remained was one final all-out assault against Melbu Frama and his city of Kadesa. Suffice to say, the stakes were immeasurably high.
During the cutscene, we see Kanzaz battling a super barrage. Seeing no way out, he unleashes a devastating self-destruction attack in an effort to take the beast down with him, and in so doing gives his comrades a chance to press on. We then see Rose's vassal dragon, Michael, using its head to rip a barrage apart, before engulfing several of the creatures with his deadly black laser beam. A short while later, a huge stone ceiling has collapsed and is about to crush both Belzac and Shirley, who are trapped under it. While Belzac struggles to prevent the debris from falling on top of them, they are spotted by Viraj, who pierces Belzac with its claw. Upon awakening and noticing the situation at hand, Shirley informs Belzac that he will not die in vain, before readying her bow and shooting an arrow at point-blank range just as the creature fires its eye laser, killing the three of them. Meanwhile, Melbu Frama is making a final stand against Zeeg. He strikes at the Red Dragoon with a powerful slash from his Dragon Buster, but to no avail as Zeeg avoids the attack and impales the Wingly Dictator. Magic radiates off Melbu's body as Zeeg is enveloped by it. The pair then fall into the city's signet sphere, destroying it. Afterward, Zeke is seen motionless, floating on some rubble, where Melbu's petrifaction spell begins to take hold, turning his body to stone. Although we never see Siu Vale or Damia, it's presumed the two dragoons died sometime before the final clash. Rose is the only dragoon of the original seven to survive the war. The capture of Kadesa and the apparent death of Melbu Frama marked both human victory and the end of the dragon campaign. The Winglies, having lost their leader, their cities, and desire to fight, surrendered. As a peace offering, they gave the humans three divine moon objects. The future kings and queens of mankind accepted these gifts, little knowing of the power residing within them. Thanks to the efforts of Emperor Diaz, Zeke, and all the others who gave their lives, the humans have seized the future and have enjoyed an era of relative peace. But the aftermath of the war would be felt for thousands of years. In the next part of this video series, we'll explore the birth of the moon child and the spawning of destruction and fear that is the black monster. If you enjoyed this deep dive into the history of the dragon campaign, please give it a like and if you want to support this channel, consider subscribing. Thank you and I'll see you in the next video.